and very few people had ever heard of a place called Guadalcanal. On and around this obscure speck in the Pacific, a six-month-long series of land, sea, and air battles came to a dramatic and violent head on November 13, 1942. The outcome of those battles turned the complete tide of the war in the Pacific. The junior officer or navigator aboard the ship was my uncle, Gene Witter Jr. His father, Gene, and his cousin, Dean, co-founded Dean Witter and Company in San Francisco. Gene was always my role model while I was growing up in the East Bay, thanks to his sister, my mother, Nancy Witter. Star football player in Piedmont High, Gene went on to Cal, where he was recognized as one of the top rugby players in the country. That's how the Cal football team discovered him, as did the Detroit Lions during his senior year. A defensive lineman, he was as quick as he was tenacious. Just a month before, before Pearl Harbor, he was the one who blocked Frankie Albert's punt in the big game with his face. <laughs> no face guards. The ball hit his face, bounced off, went into the end zone for a safety, and the underdog Cal beat Stanford in 1941. <laughs> However, only six months later, in May 1942, he graduated from Cal, received his Navy commission, married his high school sweetheart, Beatty, and headed across the Pacific aboard the USS San Francisco, all in the course of 10 days. Like I said, he was quick and tenacious. My mother saved his letters. One of the most frustrating situations for the Marines was the constant naval bombardment. The Marines could see and hear the Japanese ships, but they couldn't hit back because they didn't have their heavy artillery. General Vandergriff, the 1st Marine Division's commanding general, moved his command post away from Henderson Field to escape the nightly shelling and bombing of the airfield. He said in his memoirs that he had to, just so that he could get a decent night's sleep. On a more serious note, he also wrote about having personally experienced shell shock similar to what many of his Marines had suffered from the effects of naval gunfire. Instead of just playing defense, the Marines tried to keep the Japanese off balance and to upset their offensive plans for a counterattack by conducting aggressive patrols. General Vandergriff dispatched Colonel Evans Carlson and his 2nd Raider Battalion on a 30-day patrol to locate and harass Japanese units threatening the Marine Southern Perimeter. Lessons learned from Carlson's patrol continue to be taught in Marine training today. One of his company commanders was Major James Roosevelt, the son of the President of the United States. But Rank had few privileges on Guadalcanal. The unforgiving jungle conditions felled one in five Marines with dysentery and tropical diseases like dengue fever and malaria. The Marines would affectionately call Guadalcanal this stinking island. Somehow, despite all the hardships, shelling, and dogfights in Guadalcanal, my uncle still found time to write home. Wednesday, September 8, 1942, Marine Corps Base, Guadalcanal, SI. Dearest mother and dad, sometimes when the night has come, the alerts and scrambles of the anxious day secured at last, we're a little surprised to find ourselves still here. When I've not written you for several days, and evening alarms or exhaustion keep me from the task, I tried to make up for it early the next morning before the mail flies out. But the air of the hangar is too full of tension, plans and recapitulations, the earnest watching of the clouds, forming, dissolving, riding past in the steady trades to pile up in mountains behind, judging constantly the amount and thickness of the overcast, listening for the telephone that will send us scrambling down the field, 
I can't do it, yet I'm uneasy all day over every opportunity missed. Well, here tonight, in the aerological office corner of the base radio shack, about the only place artificial light is permitted, I can relax and talk to you. The grim reality of daily aerial combat and nightly bombardment took a heavy toll on my uncle's squadron. Of the original 21 pilots, only nine were still flying when VMF-223 was finally relieved. My uncle Charles was not among them. His luck had run out the day before when eight zeros dived on him out of the sun. His gunnery mate, Harry Jesperson, lied about his age when he was only 17, not to mention more than a foot shorter than my six foot four inch father. Harry flew in the back of their SBD uh, torpedo bomber, uh, uh, and their primary mission was to stop, stop the Japanese ships that kept on hammering the Marines and the Tokyo Express that kept reinforcing the troops on Gu Guadalcanal. This is how he described one of their missions with the Cactus Air Force. After breaking through the clouds, I saw a Japanese destroyer, so I dove on it. Since we were the only plane they saw, everybody was shooting at us. I never saw so much flak and tracers flying by me. When I dropped my bomb at 600 feet, the concussion really rocked me. As I pulled out, I saw another ship shooting at me. Harry, my gunner, looked back and said, we hit the destroyer just after midships, which pleased me greatly. What did not please me was a large shrapnel hole I spotted on my left wing near our auxiliary fuel tank. But we saw some landing craft landing Jap troops ashore, and I hit them with my 50 caliber machine guns until I ran out of ammunition. I made another run at them on our port side so Harry could get them with his 30 caliber machine guns until he too ran out of ammo. All the time, they were firing their rifles and pistols at us. When we finally landed, my wheels had no, no more touched the ground when my engine quit. We had run out of fuel, and a tractor had to pull us off the runway. The Australian Coast Guard watcher, Reg Evans, who helped rescue JFK and his PT-109 crew, confirmed the destroyer my father hit sunk the next day. Unlike Steve's Uncle Charles, my father did survive his tour on Guadalcanal. He and his squadron mates celebrated their San Francisco hom homecoming in true carrier pilot style. They flew under both bridges, the Golden Gate and Bay Bridge. They then proceeded to the top of the mark, where at the Mark Hopkins, where many believe the tailhooker's tradition of carousing began. <laughs> the Japanese had loaded their big guns with general purpose projectiles for the bombardment of Guadalcanal, instead of armor-piercing projectiles that they would have loaded if they had known they were going into a naval gunfight. Adding to the fog of war chaos that night was the use of a single radio channel called TBS, shared by Admiral Callahan and all of the ship's captains. His orders to commence and cease firing, uh, to change course, all went out to all ships simultaneously, causing considerable confusion as to which ships they were, the orders were intended for. As the battle commenced, many of the ship's captains ignored or didn't hear Callahan's orders. Thus, this had a tragic consequence for one of the American cruisers, the Atlanta, flagship of Rear Admiral Norman Scott. It was mistakenly shelled by San Francisco as well as by the Japanese destroyers that eventually left her in a sinking condition. At 0153, San Francisco started taking fire from the first Japanese battleship. Admiral Callahan's last reported order came through loud and clear. Go for the big ones. I want you to go for the big ones first. At dawn, on that fateful Friday the 13th, a Japanese submarine spotted her. Unable to maneuver, all that the crew of the lucky San Francisco could do was to helplessly watch as torpedoes passed ahead of the ship and safely beneath the ship. Tragically, however, 
They went on to hit and sink the already crippled cruiser USS Juno. She lost nearly 700 crew members, including the five Sullivan brothers. The Witter family received a telegram from the Navy Department on Thanksgiving Day, 1942. It was only a few days after receiving Ensign Gene Witter's last letter, dated November 8th, in which he mentioned how he was looking forward to joining the Dean Witter family business after the war. He was buried at sea off the coast of San Cristobal Island on November 13th. A Navy destroyer escort was later named after him. One of 23 Navy ships named after those lost during the battle for Guadalcanal. Lieutenant Charles Kendrick was hastily buried on a jungle ridge by a party of Marines who bravely slipped behind enemy lines and searched for his downed plane. The War Department had no record of the site and had abandoned all efforts to recover his body. body. <clears throat> Haunted by this fact, in 1947, his father, Charles Kendrick Sr., at age 70, made the difficult journey to Guadalcanal, armed only with a photograph that showed an irregular line of trees in the background. With the help of natives recruited by a local missionary, and after two weeks of grueling treks, he finally found his son's wildcat. After three days of digging, he found his son. Back at Henderson Field, the missionary arranged a simple mass, and a proud father brought his United States Marine back home to his final resting place in San Francisco.